Hi, my name is Tony Santo and I'm a large format photographer. This is my third video in a series on how to develop slide or transparency film utilizing the E6 process. Please stay tuned for updates on my ongoing experiment. Let's begin by taking a look at my cost analysis and processing efficiency. The first column in this table shows the three occasions that I developed my slide film on as well as a future run of the process. The next three columns show how much film I actually developed during each time I ran the process plus a projection of what I'm hoping to achieve during a future run. The next column shows the amount of money that it would have cost me to process the respective amount of film at a lab based upon the pricing you see below the table. It is important to note that the processing cost of 8x10 sheet film went up for 2016, so the June 2016 costs reflects this change. Also, these prices do not include the cost of shipping and handling. The following column shows the actual cost of developing the film myself with my Jobo processor. The next two columns list the absolute and relative savings for processing the film myself. I'm defining absolute savings as the monetary difference between the lab cost and actual cost, taking into consideration my initial sunk cost of $746.59 on a perpetual basis. So this column evaluates the fact that I have already spent money and I'm interested in seeing when will I actually begin to see savings. As you can see, the absolute savings didn't manifest until the third time I ran this process and to date has totaled about $350 plus shipping and handling. For relative savings, I'm ignoring my initial sunk cost of $746.59 and evaluating the savings on a per occasion analysis. So this column evaluates my savings on the amount of money that I have to spend to run the process on that particular occasion. This is money that is not leaving my wallet at the time of processing and to date has totaled about $745 plus shipping and handling. The last column shows the amount of chemistry that I wasted owing to not hoarding enough film to use all of the chemistry or chemistry loss because of an undetected crack in my containers. If I hadn't wasted this much chemistry, I would have significantly increased my savings. A total of four liters of wasted chemistry would have processed almost half of my film from my June 2016 run. So what are the take home messages here? The first is that I became much more efficient with each subsequent trial of running the process. This is mainly due to making sure that I have hoarded enough film to make use of my chemistry, maximizing the film capacity of my largest developing tanks rather than processing smaller batches of film which consumes more chemistry, and making sure that my working solution tanks did not have any leaks in them. The second point is though although the initial cost of processing all of the necessary chemicals is high, the savings in terms of hard costs can add up in the long term as long as you don't mind putting the time in that it takes to process this quantity of film. Speaking of labor hours, each time I process a batch of film, it takes me roughly 30 minutes to prepare everything, so things like loading the film into the drums, filling my chemistry bottles with the appropriate amount of chemical, discarding waste chemistry from the previous run, etc., and roughly 30 minutes to run the development process for a total of 60 minutes per run. To put that into perspective, this slide is showing you that I've run the E6 process a total 72 times over three separate occasions, which means that I put in 72 hours of my own labor. For me, it's a labor of love and it keeps the quality assurance of this process up to me. The long-term storage of sealed photographic chemicals is of great paramount if you purchase this amount of chemistry. So in the following slide, I'm going to show you how long my chemistry has lasted past the expiration date by keeping the containers at room temperature in a desert dry environment. The first column lists the chemical. The next column lists how long Fujifilm says the unopened concentrate will last past the production date. This is followed by a column that lists how many months over the time frame suggested by Fujifilm the chemistry was when I developed my film back in June of 2016 using chemistry that I purchased in September of 2014. For example, the first developer is viable for 18 months from the production date according to Fujifilm, but my chemistry was five months beyond this recommendation, so it was 23 months past the production date. Since the color developers in bleach are supplied in quantities to allow you to run the process two times, this third time around I needed to order fresh chemistry so I don't have long-term data for those respective cells. So as you can see, my chemistry was anywhere from 1 to 33 months past the recommended time frame by Fujifilm. The next column shows how much of my original chemistry that I purchased in September 2014 I have left in terms of the number of 10 liter batches I can make. In other words, how many occasions can I run this process before I run out of chemistry? 
The color developers and bleach were not applicable here since every second time I run the process, I need to order fresh chemistry. The last column describes what viable chemistry should look like. For me, the take home message is that the unopened chemistry is viable even months after being produced and beyond what Fujifilm says is the maximum amount of time that the chemical will remain usable. As a trained researcher, I have seen this on many occasions with assay kits used to measure things like blood concentrations of HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, etc. in an experimental laboratory environment where the manufacturer lists a use-by date, but the chemicals are still very viable for the purpose of which they were intended. We would use them as teaching tools for students where it wasn't catastrophic if the chemicals didn't work. The same case can be made for prescription medications. While many may lose potency with age, they still have some overall effect past their expiration date. Please do not use expired prescription medications unless otherwise directed by a physician and or pharmacist. Let me iterate that I am not saying that photographic chemicals do not lose their potency over time. They certainly will but rather that Fujifilm has underrated the shelf life of their chemistry, at least according to what I've experienced with the batch of chemicals that I have received. I may encounter a different experience with future chemistry. The last thing I'd like to report is the longest time frame that I have waited to develop an exposed piece of film. At the end of the second time that I processed my slide film, I had about six pieces of film that I couldn't develop because I didn't have sufficient chemistry. So I just saved the exposed film for the next time, which was in June of 2016. The longest span of time from when I took the image to when I developed the film was 13 months. It is important to note that I kept the film frozen during that entire span of time. This is the image that waited 13 months to be developed. As you can see, it turned out just fine. Well, as always, thanks for watching. videos educational or enjoy watching them for the entertainment value, please consider supporting me so that I can continue to produce new content ad-free. By subscribing to my channel, sharing my videos with your friends, or submitting a monetary donation in the amount of the value you've received by watching my videos, you will help me deliver the quality educational photography content you love. Thanks in advance for your support.